Can you all remain standing for a moment of silent prayer and meditation? Moment of silent prayer and meditation, no noise upstairs there. Thank you, we may all be seated. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Let me uh, take this opportunity to welcome our Honorable Premier, members of the Executive Council, the Chief Whip, leaders of political parties, members of the Provincial Legislature, Deputy Chief Whip, um, the team from GPG, led by the 18 DG, the team from GPL, led by the Secretary. Let me also acknowledge our stakeholders who have joined our sitting. The people of Gauteng, you are all welcome uh, this morning. Thank you very much. We have not received any formal apologies this morning, but we'll make the following announcements. The Gauteng Provincial Legislature will be launching the 16 days of activism of no violence against women and children tomorrow in Western area. All members are invited. We are also saddened by the passing of our former SCM manager, Ms. Refilion Goka, who was gunned down in broad daylight by her husband in front of the children. And it is very much sad. As we mark the 16 days of activism, we still see men doing these horrible acts. But we're also saddened by the passing on of uh, Mr. Fence Mangope in the office of the speaker, who was also gunned down on Friday night. We also want to pass our deepest condolences to our deputy speaker, who has lost um, her grandmom. May all the departed soul rest in eternal peace. While we also observe all this uh, sad news, but also on my side, it's a happy birthday for my grandson. Happy birthday, uh, Tato Junior, the, the, the friend of the deputy chief, of the chief whip. Uh, I want to check if is there a member who wants to do an announcement? No announcement from members. In terms of Rule 79, subsection 1, MEC statements, we have not received anything. In terms of Rule 81, subsection 1, member statement, Honorable Kekana. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Madam Speaker, and good morning to the Premier, members of the Executive all members of the legislature and the people of Houghton. Uh, in accordance with Rule 81, subsection 1, I, Honorable Erufile Kekan of the ANC, tables the following member statement on 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. <laughs> Madam Speaker, in 1991, at the inaugural uh, United Nations Women's Global Leadership Institute, Activists started the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence, an annual international campaign that starts on the 25th of November and ends on the 10th of December. To date, 16 Days of Activism continues to be used as an organizing strategy by individuals and organizations around the world to call for the prevention and elimination of violence against women and girls. The global theme for this year's 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence is UNITE, Activism to End Violence Against Women and Girls. In South Africa, the scourge of gender-based violence and femicide reached alarming levels that the president of the country declared it a pandemic along COVID-19. As a response to the scourge, the NC-led government through the president of the country 
announced an emergency response action plan to gender-based violence and femicide in 2019. Madam Speaker, the roadmap of the ANC-led government, GGT 2030, defines the housing we want as one way, and I quote, women enjoy their rights free from all forms of patriarchy. One of our biggest obstacles to reading our country of gender-based violence and femicide remains societal mindset. And as members of this August House, we need to unite and speak with one voice and advocate for the change of societal mindset that seeks to see women as objects and secondary citizens. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Honorable Litoba. Uh, good morning, Madam Speaker. Good morning, Premier and all mem- the honorable members in the House. Madam, ma- Madam Speaker, on the 18th May 2021, in this August House, I decried the attack on the emergency medical services personnel. At the time, two personnel members were shot at while responding to a gunshot incident at Dugatol, informal settlement in Jimiston. This followed many other attacks of uh, EMS uh, personnel that took place in various communities, including an attack by a community member in Mahalis. Sadly, I stand here today decry the same action in the recent attack. Paramedics were attacked and a patient killed in a mob justice attack in Atrejville in Swani on Monday evening. In September 2022, the Department of Health reported that there has been 11 incidents this year alone. This is in uh, additional to 12 incidents recorded in 2021. We urge uh, the communities to work with us. So it looks like the midterm budget policy statement for 2022 is uh, currently underway. And of course, are they touching on to, you know, already such a touching, um, you know, issues. It, it hasn't necessarily um, begun in its, you know, fluidity. But um, for now, uh, Kekana, Honorable Refule Kekana, you know, came up and, you know, spoke about the 16 days of activism, um, the, the launch that's actually expected to take place at uh, Western Noria. And of course, we all know that, uh, you know, the 16 days of activism for No Violence Against Women and Children campaign is starting on the 25th of November and uh, it's taking all the way up until uh, 10 December um, which is also seen as the Nas- International Human Rights Day. So uh, you, uh, apparently it's it, last year, um, on 2021 this, the, uh, during the midterm budget for 2021 um, it was stated that 294,000 beneficiaries um, will be reached through the program of No Violence Against Children and Women you know, including 16 days of activism. So I hope that, you know, it has been reached and objectives have been met. Um, we are in a pretty, pretty um, tight predicament when it comes to violence, you know, against women and children in South Africa. And I'm just hoping um, that, you know, more uh, financial allocations are, you know, um, implemented um, during this midterm budget um, for the year 2022. Um, this is indeed you before noon. Remember that the live streaming is taking place on a U. FM 898 on Facebook, Instagram, as well as on Twitter. And uh, more will be unfolding and we'll be sharing with you right here on a UFM. The Purple Gang coming to you live um, in Gauteng, Johannesburg. Red Pairs complains in Swane, a non-delivery of basic services in the city of Tobek. 
which are all governed by the minority coalition governments. Madam Speaker, we know that the South African Constitution does not contain specific provisions regulating the formation and functioning of coalition governments in the national, provincial, and local spheres of government. And neither does ordinary legislation contain such specific regulatory provisions. This has left the machinery of government, especially at local level, vulnerable, and us as legis legislators challenged. Madam Speaker, the vulnerability, vulnerability of coalition local governments is to such an extent that they are at the mercy of the whims of elected representatives and political party leaders. The mayhem constitute, uh, constituting dissolving and reconstituting municipal coalition governments reflects the anarchy that is inherent in the coalition governments and their resultant instability. Madam Speaker, we might not be clear at this stage of what is to be done, short of changing the constitution or effecting legislative amendment, both of which may be long-term solutions. However, something has to be done to prevent the undesirable instability from continuing. And this may require a legal approach or preconditions for stability that would hold for longer. After all, we should have learned something of value from the government of national unity, uh, the case at end provincial government in 1994, both of which were coalition governments. As the president recently said, our ANC government reaffirms its principled approach to coalitions to build local democracy and service delivery and improve thank accountability you. to thank its citizens. Thank you, Honorable. I thank you. Thank you. Honorable Dos Santos. Sorry, Madam Speaker. Honourable Speaker, I rise in terms of Rule 81. The scourge of sexual abuse and violence in our schools in the province is saddening. These horrifying and cowardly acts have resulted in serious debates amongst different stakeholders in the province and across the country. However, I am more frustrated that we continue talking without taking any action. Our children deserve better, Honourable Speaker. I'll be writing to the Premier, imploring him to appoint a Commission of Inquiry into sexual abuse cases at all schools in Gauteng. I will also write to the Education MEC to ask for his support in this regard. Speaker, according to Section 27.2e of the Constitution, the Premier has the power to appoint a Commission of Inquiry. A full-blown inquiry would thoroughly investigate both known and unknown abuse cases in our schools and provide substantial solutions to the Gauteng Department of Education in fighting the scourge. The DA believes that all learners must be protected, be made aware of processes which they can follow to report sexual abuse cases and do so confidently with the emotional support that they deserve. Learners who have experienced sexual abuse, violence, assault, any other form of bullying suffer deep psychological damage and this affects their ability to learn, which in turn places their futures at risk. We must take a stand and we must work together to ensure our children are safe, kept safe from these sexual predators who prowl amongst our youth, vulnerable and defenseless children. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Miller. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and good morning to everyone. Madam Speaker, tomorrow marks the start of the 16 days of activism for no violence Can you switch no on your video? Can you switch on your video? I'm, 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 I, I am unable to, uh, Madam Speaker. My um, settings on the laptop won't allow it. Uh, IT is going to have to source it for me, please. Okay, continue. Thank you. Madam Speaker, tomorrow marks the start of the 16 days of activism for no violence against women and children. This year, the theme for the 16 Days of Activism is Unite Activism to End Violence Against Women and Girls. Despite numerous awareness campaigns, despite numerous awareness campaigns being run by the government, gender-based violence remains a plague in our country. More needs to be done to ensure that survivors of gender-based violence can access the resources they need to heal from the trauma they have suffered. In addition, the DNA backlog needs to be addressed 
as this means justice for the survivors of gender-based violence will be delayed and only adds to the trauma that they have suffered. Madam Speaker, all victim empowerment centres must be fully functional and equipped with all the resources needed to provide support to all our vulnerable members of the community. Furthermore, we call on our police officers and social workers who are dealing with survivors of gender-based violence to be more sensitive in how they handle the cases presented to them. In doing this, we will ensure that all vulnerable members of our society who fall prey to the scourge of gender-based violence will have the courage to report such cases. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. We, that's, that concludes member statement in terms of Rule 81, subsection 1. In terms of Rule 120, motion without notice, we don't have any. I just want to check if is there a member who wants to provide or give notice of a motion in terms of Rule 121. None. Thank you very much. Can I therefore request the Secretary to read the first order? Introduction of the Gauteng Provincial Adjustment Appropriation Bill G004 of 2022 for the 2022-23 financial year. Honorable Mamabulo. Speaker, I'm here to present the <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Can I be protected? So you love your old car. Um, you've even made it cool with red seats and shiny rims to match. So why not get car insurance that's just as unique? Essential car insurance from Outsurance has been designed and priced for cars older than five years, unfinanced and valued at 125,000 rand. You can choose theft, accidental, and one million rand liability cover, and it pays you in cash if you claim for a quote. SMS car to 38462. Outsurance is a licensed insurer and FSP. T's and C's certainly do apply. Um, we are still here for the mid-term um, uh, budget speech um, here in Gauteng in, in, uh, in Johannesburg. I almost said Kharanku. Um, in Johannesburg. So they've actually touched on something quite um, you know, disturbing because this morning I woke up to the news of a young boy going to school carrying a panga simply because he was bullied and which then raises the question of you know, safety in schools as well. So I'm looking Looking at the 2021 um, plan that was set in motion last year, talking about a school safety promotion. And of course, you know, this plan was aimed at combating um, increased incidences of violence at schools in an integrated manner. And uh, this included school searches as part of the plan, um, as well as multidisciplinary diversion programs and partnerships um, that will also, you know, um, be part of uh, combating this, uh, you know, uh, lack of safety rather in schools, you know, and also combating alcohol and drug abuse and also, you know, particularly in institutions of higher learning. Uh, social crime prevention activations through MASP as well as women assault survival programs um, were also supposed to be put in place, including deploying and training 10 patroller uh, teams per ward. So that is what happened in the year 2021. We're about to find out what exactly is going to be happening and what has transpired during the year of 2022 here um, for the midterm budget policy statement that is currently taking place with the Gauteng um, uh, Provincial Legislature in Gauteng. Stewardship of our Honorable Premier Panyaza Lisunufi. As we present this medium term budget policy statement, we do so fully conscious of the directives that were announced by the Honorable Premier just last month. And for context, the following are the five elevated priorities. Economic recovery and reconstruction, 
strengthening the battle against crime, corruption, vandalism, and overcoming lawlessness. Changing the living conditions in the townships, informal settlements, and hostel, hostels otherwise known as Tish. Prioritization of the health and wellness of the people and strengthening the capacity of the state. Honorable members, it is important to clarify that these five elevated priorities are very well aligned and seek to consolidate the implementation of growing Houghton Together 2030 blueprint. In other words, these five elevated priorities constitute and represent both a point of convergence and continuity with GGT 2030 priorities. The adjustment budget that we are tabling today is about making permissible amendments, which includes unforeseeable and unavoidable expenditure in the budget of the current financial year, which of course was tabled in March 2022. Put differently, the budget adjustment gives us an opportunity to already be planting the seeds for the medium and long-term funding of the elevated priorities. Honorable members, since the announcement of the five elevated priorities, departments have been hard at work fine-tuning and aligning their five-year strategic plans and annual performance plans to ensure that these priorities are at the center of their programs and budgets. It is therefore anticipated that the work that these departments are currently doing on five elevated priorities will be further articulated comprehensively in the 2023 State of the Province Address and the 2023-2024 Provincial Budget. In other words, the five elevated priorities must be fully embedded in the planning and budgeting processes of line function departments. In relation to the above context, it is important to announce that we are repositioning and reconfiguring the budget to embed a new approach that embraces some of the following principles. Mainstreaming and elevating gender responsiveness, spatial referencing, and that is tracking and tracing the geography of our spending, especially in the townships, informal settlements, and hostels, as we call it, Tish. Full compliance with the letter and spirit of the Public Finance Management Act, with emphasis on the perennial problems of irregular, unauthorized, wasteful, and fruitless expenditure, including under expenditure in the province. Value for money, that is ensuring that every cent that we spend creates value for the people. Having outlined the context and core principles of this medium-term budget policy statement, let me now proceed to the important issue of elevating and mainstreaming gender in the budget. Madam Speaker, building on the 1956 historic Women's March, our country has taken significant strides to advance the struggle of gender equality and women empowerment. However, statistics continue to tell us that women and girls are still disproportionately affected by the crisis of poverty, inequality, and discrimination purely based on the gender they were, not, they were assigned at birth. It is for this reason that on the 27th March 2019, National Cabinet approved the gender responsive budget, budgeting, monitoring, and evaluation framework. 
This important policy intervention was adopted to improve our province performance when it comes to the empowerment of women and in achieving gender parity by institutionalizing and mainstreaming gender responsiveness in the planning and budgeting across departments in the province. The Houghton Provincial Government has already increased the budget directed towards women empowerment initiatives by 4% year on year from 46 to 46.2 billion in the 2021-2022 financial year to 48.1 billion in 2022-2023. And this has been followed by a rise in expenditure on related budget items across the province. In this 2022 medium term budget policy statement, we are committing ourselves to continue in our efforts to drive gender responsive budgeting and towards ensuring that the fiscal framework contributes to women empowerment. As we present this medium term budget policy statement, we are deeply conscious of the fact that our country will tomorrow launch the 16 days of activism for no violence against women and children. Honorable members, just last week, I was deeply inspired when I visited the Tsakani Parliamentary Constituency Office. There, in partnership with the Commission for Gender Equality, members of the community have decided to take a stand. They have put together a practical program to address gender-based violence in their community. Of course, working with civil society, law enforcement, and other community-based organizations, they are taking this sketch head on. These residents of our province have established what is called the multi-sectoral round table on gender-based violence and femicide. This collective effort will be launched during the 16 days campaign, and of course, we will seek to make sure that we fully support this program. Honorable members, it is through this type of activism that communities working with government can form a united front to fight the sketch. We therefore call on the people of Gauteng to work together to stop gender-based gender -based violence and femicide in our homes in our communities and our places of work and everywhere in our society. We must do away with the cultures, the practices and behaviors that still perpetuate gender inequality and femicide. As the Gauteng Provincial Government, our efforts to fight gender-based violence and femicide are led by the Department of Community Safety in the capable hands of MEC Mazivuk. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We are implementing multi-sectoral multi plans to fight GBV and build a safe society for women, children, and the LGBTQ a plus community in line with the national strategic plan on gender-based violence and femicide. Madam Speaker, please allow me to outline the principle for spatial referencing in our budget. One which is essentially about building the capacity across Gauteng provincial government departments to direct spending at the smallest geographic location, such as what across the province. This approach to budgeting is even more important if we are to realize in monetary terms our strategic goal of focusing on townships, informal settlements, and hostels. In other words, the principle of spatial referencing or the geography of money will include infrastructure and non-infrastructure spending to link resources and coordinates to measure appropriate responses, especially in poverty-stricken spaces. 
Honorable members, we are now ready to outline and share with you the economic outlook that underpins this medium-term budget policy statement. At the outset, and as a matter of emphasis, let us acknowledge the difficult context in which we are presenting this year's budget. It is now common cause that the global economic environment is under severe pressure. In a report titled World Economic Outlook Countering the Cost of Living Crisis, released just last month, the International Monetary Fund says in both the advanced economies and the emerging markets and developing economies, household purchasing power has been eroded by inflation that has increased more rapidly than the wages, and this has reduced household spending. In response, central banks across the world are increasing interest rates and contracting the money supply faster than expected, which will translate into lower growth rates as the cost of money rises. The global economy is now estimated to grow by 3.2% in 2022 before slowing down to 27 in 2023, thus reflecting the downturn in major economies. Right here at home, National Treasury through the Finance Minister, Honorable Inoko Tongwana, announced during the medium-term budget policy statement last month that our country's economy is estimated to grow by just 1.9% in 2022. Growth for 2023 and 2024 is focused to be at 1.4% and 1.7% respectively. As a result of this low economic output, our gross domestic product is now 4.5 trillion rands, which is still smaller than what it was in 2019. As a result, we are expected to reach pre-COVID-19 levels only next year. As you may be aware, Statistics SA yesterday released the latest consumer price index which shows that inflation increased by 7.6% in the month of October. Honorable members, right here in Gauteng, while the global economy and of course South Africa's economic and fiscal environment points to a difficult future, we strongly believe that on the positive side, our province possesses unique competitive advantages to grow the economy, to create jobs, and improve the quality of life of the people of our province. Let me just emphasize this point, honorable members, that whilst the world economic situation points to a very difficult way forward, but on the positive side, we believe our province has upside, uh, upside potential and, of course, advantages that can create jobs, grow the economy, and ensure a good quality of life of our people. So where will hope come from? And that's the question we're seeking to deal with. Our competitive advantages include the following. 35% contribution to GDP, which is equivalent to 1.6 trillion rands. Whilst this contribution is much acclaimed, we should caution against basking in its glory or even becoming complacent about it. As you may surely agree, there exist risks that other provinces may reduce our share of national GDP, even if it is by a small margin. It is therefore important that we mobilize all economic players in the province to work together in addressing the structural impediments to growth. Our province also contributes 42% to industrial output and 53% to exports. More than 60% of all freight to our key trading partners as a country 
departs from and arrive in Gauteng city region, making it the internal hub for freight, logistics, and warehousing. Comparatively speaking, our province boasts state-of-the-art infrastructure such as roads, airports, rail, and premium, premium digital connectivity. We have the most attractive tourist sites, especially those that tell the history of our struggle, most of which are based in the townships. We do have an opportunity to invest resources in these sites in line with our strategic focus on townships, informal settlements, and hostels, otherwise known as Tish. Gauteng is also home to the most advanced, globally integrated, and stable financial sector that is world-class tertiary institutions and most dynamic automotive sector. Our province is the most populous with 16.1 million people, supported by one of the biggest health systems on the continent. Honorable members, to reposition our province as the destination for investment we will be working closely with the Department of Economic Development and its entities led by MEC Mutara to make sure that um, we realize and of course get value from these uh, competitive advantages that we have outlined. Let me also say to this end, I visited the Houting Investment Center, which is a one-stop shop for international and local investors to the province. We will be working with the Department of Economic Development to take the province to the world. It is a you before noon right here on uh, UFM, the Purple Gang, coming to you live from Gauteng, from Johannesburg. And of course, it is the medium-term budget policy statement, and it is uh, the first one, you know, with... Uh, um, uh, Premier um, Banyaza Lisufi under the leadership of Premier Banyaza Lisufi. So, um, you know, they're going to be looking at, uh, you know, the policy directives that were announced, um, you know, by the Honorable Premier last month and uh, looking at the five elevated priorities um, such as the economic recovery and reconstruction, um, strengthening the battle against the crime corruption as well as vandalism and also overcoming lawlessness and uh, changing the living conditions of uh, in townships in formal settlements as well as uh, hostels and of course the prioritization of uh, the health and wellness of people and as well as strengthening um, the capacity of uh, the state. That is what is unfolding right here and also just understanding that you know everything that's happening here is so that you know we can reach the growing together, um, growing Gauteng together rather, 2030 blueprint that has been set um, you know for uh, Gauteng to achieve. All of this is unfolding on you before noon. My name is Pilo Mudiha and of course we're always in tune with you. Keep it locked on the social pages. Um, we are streaming live. It's UFM 898 on Facebook, Instagram, as well as on Twitter. Oh, in a responsible manner and protect the poor and the most vulnerable in society from the existential threat of climate change. Our responsibility as governments to protect humanity against climate change was discussed at the United Nations Climate Change Conference, commonly referred to as COP27, which concluded its business in Egypt just last week. As Gauteng, we have an overarching climate change response plan, which seeks to respond to the impacts in a way that capitalizes on particular opportunities for positive change. Specifically, the climate change response outcomes identified in the Houghton City region relate to ecosystems, the quality of life, disaster risk management, and the green economy. Honorable members, let me now talk about the important work we are doing to stimulate growth and create jobs in our province. One of the biggest challenges facing our country, and of course our province, is youth unemployment. We are very proud and very pleased to report that more than 100,000 young people who have been through the TEPO 1 million program have been placed into job opportunities, enabling them to earn a living. <clears throat> 
more than 60% of this are young women. We are developing special economic zones to crowd in massive investment, grow the economy and create jobs for our people. We also use our infrastructure spend to improve the delivery of services to the people. This investment is also used to reverse apartheid spatial planning by building integrated human settlements. A 4.3 billion rands investment has already been secured for the Tswani Automotive SEZ, Special Economic Zone. It is estimated that once completed, the Tswani SEZ will generate 20,000 jobs. To date, the project has created 344 permanent jobs and 219 temporary construction jobs. Honorable members, last week, Thursday, I visited the OR Tambo International Airport SEZ to assess the work that has been done on the site. I can therefore confirm that progress has been made on this multi-site development project focusing on different sectors, including jewelry and diamonds, agro-processing, pharmaceuticals, advanced manufacturing, and capital equipment. Honorable members, the Expanded Public Works Program has been very instrumental in our province in creating job opportunities and uh, for the poor and the socially excluded people. In the period April 2019 and March 2022, EPWP has generated more than two million job opportunities in Gauteng province. Honorable members, the current administration is expanding infrastructure service delivery, which will require us to employ 80,000 people over the next 12 months from Everton, Westbury, Soweto, and Soshanguve to construct residential fill in units in the townships. You can already see, honorable members, that we are you know, looking at the geography of money. We are following money where it's going in the different spaces in the province. As I said, TIDA has given a major boost to our efforts towards changing fundamentally the structure of our township economy by vigorously promoting local production, the development of SMMEs, cooperatives, and township enterprises. Last month, the Gauteng Enterprise Propeller, the Industrial Development Corporation, uh, SASME Fund, and Standard Bank launched the SMME Crisis Partnership Fund, which immediately made 850 million debt funding available to assist township businesses to rebuild and grow. This is a game changer, and as most township businesses are either unable to access or do not qualify for funding from the formal banking sector. Some of the agent tasks that the provincial government is implementing in relation to TIDA includes refurbishment and support of 20,000 stores in townships. Completion of 7,757 fiber installations to create cloud zones for township use. Creation of 13 taxi economy zones. I must emphasize this one, 13 taxi economic zones, which are projected to stimulate the creation of 4,758 jobs. Further support will be given to 9,000 subsistence farmers in upscaling their farms and releasing 10,000 hectares of agricultural land for use by small farmers. Honorable members, let me now deal with our infrastructure delivery program, which is still characterized by continuous under-expenditure on both conditional and equitable share funding and lack of multi-year planning resulting in the province losing significant opportunity gains derived from infrastructure investments. To address these challenges and ensure that projects are delivered within budget and on time, including in the SEZs, Houghton Provincial Treasury will subject every project contained in the estimates of capital expenditure 
to the project readiness metrics or the project readiness lab. Honorable members, infrastructure remains a key policy priority and modernizing infrastructure project readiness metrics is more than necessary and will address amongst other things the following. A rigorous process to assess infrastructure plans and project lists to be submitted to Treasury timely. This will allow adequate time for credible planning. Let me make this point that unrealistic time frames, persisting land issues, especially ownership, appropriateness of the land, land zoning and services must be resolved before proceeding with projects. All infrastructure departments will have to finalize designs before projects can be put in the list of infrastructure program to be implemented. A move away from lengthy procurement processes so that implementation can commence earnestly is very much important. Simply put, honorable members, and as a matter of emphasis, if departments cannot demonstrate readiness on the implementation of infrastructure, the budget will not be presented for consideration by the House. Because, honorable members, we cannot be a party or be part of retaining money to the fiscals or failing to spend the money allocated for infrastructure. We rather not put that budget to the vote so that departments can finalize the issues and we know this project and the money, the project will proceed, the money will be spent. If a project is not ready, we must not publish it in that booklet called Estimates of Capital Expenditure because we know that project is a candidate for poor spending. Why put it in the booklet? <clears throat> Honorable members, let me now turn to the 2022 adjustments budget. The main budget tabled on the 9th of March 2022, and I must acknowledge by MEC Nomantin Komorale Hoko, amounted to 152.9 billion. Today, this is being adjusted by a net 2.4 billion to make it 155.3 billion rands. The changes to the budget primarily to respond to unforeseen and unavoidable circumstances, as well as realignment of departmental mandates in line with the five elevated priorities are a combination of additions to the provincial equitable share, surrender of funds to the provincial revenue fund, as well as rolling over of unspent funds from 2021-2022 financial year. In respect of additions to the baseline, in the 2022-2023 adjustment budget, Gauteng Provincial Government Departments will be receiving a total of 1.5 billion rands, disaggregated as follows. Economic development, the department will be receiving a total of 60 million, of which 40 million is to fund the costs of diesel to alleviate the existing electricity supply challenges that are affecting the operations of tenants at the Tswani Automotive Special Economic Zone. This is an interim measure. Whilst the city of Tswani, and we hope they will do, they must address the bulk electricity infrastructure, because if they don't do so, they are holding back job creation and other important interventions in the a project. 20 million will be allocated to the completion of the top structure at the jewelry manufacturing precinct of the OR Tambo International Airport SEZ. Before I proceed, honorable members, just emphasis, I would like to um, you know, ask you to visit this site, the, the precinct in the OR Tambo uh, SEZ 
that has and government has done a good job to attract the private sector. In particular, I'm very much impressed by the capacity of government to attract a gold refinery, to attract one of the best freight and uh, 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 warehousing and storage facility for food processing. Um, uh, diamond uh, processors and of course um, many others like uh, they are already looking at um, machinery and equipment to support hydrogen such as fuel cells and of course um, the electrolyzer. It is important to visit that site because that site gives practical meaning to the concept of a developmental state. State interventions and the private sector, which are not in conflict. That dialectic is unfolding in our SEZ. It's a very good place to go. Health Honorable Members, it's receiving one billion, which is allocated towards offsetting the pressures on the compensation of employees arising from the public sector wage settlement agreement. And two million to undertake all needs assessment and scoping of works per facility in preparation for addressing alternative water and energy supply. Education, the department will be receiving an additional 85 million to supplement their infrastructure funding that will realistically be spent by the end of the financial year. Let me repeat, that will be realistically spent by the end of the financial year. Human settlements will receive 100 million, which is being allocated towards the completion of the incomplete infrastructure. And we are very confident that this infrastructure project will be completed and that uh, the money will also be spent. Community safety. Honorable members, the department will be receiving an additional 173 million rands to respond decisively in the battle against crime, corruption, vandalism, and lawlessness in the province as mandated in the five elevated priorities towards the end of the sixth administration. And we are very confident that this money will be well spent to fight crime. These funds will go towards the recruitment and training of peace wardens, tools of trade, procurement of 10 drones, 50 vehicles, and 500,000 panic buttons. We must say to the criminals, we must say to the criminals, their days are numbered. The drone will be moving around. The panic button will be checking them. We are going to give the criminals a run in this province. And we are putting our money right there where we said it must go to in terms of the priorities that have been outlined. So, honorable members, the priorities we are talking about are not something that is still coming. We are already funding them here, these priorities. I can hear the opposition is uh, upset that we're already funding our priorities now. A total of 39 million is allocated towards offsetting the shortfall in the compensation of employees' budget exacerbated by the public sector wage settlement. An infrastructure development department will be receiving an additional 43 million to offset pressures in the goods and services budget, specifically towards legal costs, where it is a defendant in its capacity as implementing agent for routing provincial government infrastructure delivery. On the expanded mandate of routing provincial treasury,
Honorable members, let me now speak about this very important issue. You will recall that when announcing his priorities, Honorable Premier Lisufi directed Provincial Treasury to do the following. One, to ensure alternative funding for ETOL debt so that ETOLs are finally a thing of the past. To establish a state-owned bank. And three, establish a state-owned pharmaceutical company. Let me take this opportunity to briefly detail progress on the work that we are doing to implement these tasks. Honorable members, with regard to the ETOL debt, as you know, the Minister of Finance, Godongwana, said the following when he delivered the medium term budget policy statement to Parliament last month, and I quote. The uncertainty surrounding the Houghton Freeway Improvement Project continues to have a major negative implication for road construction in the country. We need to move on from the debates of previous years and find solutions to this challenge. To resolve the funding impasse the Houting Provincial Government has agreed to contribute 30% to settling Sunrise debt and interest obligations, while national government covers 70%. Houting will also cover the cost of maintaining the 201 kilometers and associated interchanges of the roads and any additional investment in the road will be funded through either the existing electronic toll infrastructure or new toll plazas or any other revenue source within their area of responsibility. Now, <clears throat> honorable members, Government proposes to make an initial allocation of 23.7 billion from the national fiscals, which will be dispersed on strict conditions. Close quote to the minister. The minister's pronouncement has the following implications for the province. Firstly, it is creating a framework to bring to finality the long outstanding ETOL matter and the funding of Houghton Freeway Improvement Project 2 and 3. Secondly, absorption of the debt on a 70-30 ratio between national and Houghton Provincial Government, respectively. From its own resources, Houghton Provincial Government has the following obligations or responsibilities. 30% contribution to the ETOL debt, maintaining the GFIP road network and expanding GFIP 2 and 3. As Gauteng Provincial Government, we will optimize existing sources of revenue and introduce alternative sources of revenue without burdening further the citizens of the province. Honorable members, the Houghton Provincial Government reaffirms the following. Its commitment to the repayment of the 30% share of debt amounting to 12.9 billion, demonstrating beyond any reasonable doubt its adherence to the principle of the rule of law and respect for contractual obligations. Considering the absorption of the debt by government and that each all countries will not be part of the future Houghton Provincial Government revenue generation model. This therefore closes the chapter on ETOLs. I am therefore pleased 
I am therefore pleased to report that Premier Lisufi, on Monday, this week, 21st November 2022, led a delegation of the province and met with the finance minister, Kotongwana, whom I think we must also thank for hearing the voice of the people of Kaute. And in that meeting, it included a Sanral technical team. Honorable members, in this meeting, it was agreed that as part of the implementation of the announcement made by the minister, national government and Gauteng provincial government will conclude a memorandum of agreement to address the following. The very first one. Gauteng provincial government's proposal of a hybrid model of financing its ETOL and GFIP obligations. This hybrid model is to have multiple funding sources that will come from Gauteng as well as those that are administered by national government. We have also agreed that um, we will um, look at spreading the period for the payment of the 30% contribution by Gauteng. And I can tell you our position is that the debt be reasonably spread over a long term as it was in any way a long term debt. Maintenance of GFIP one roads and network, that will also go into the MOU. Expansion of uh, GFIP two and three road network, and of course, most importantly, the MOU will also tie the date to switch off the countries so that when you pass there, you don't hear two or three of the countries on the road. That date is coming. We have also agreed on the repurposing of the countries for purposes of crime fighting uh, Chovich. All these issues, honorable members, will go in the MOU that we are finalizing with national government. With respect to the introduction of the hybrid funding model, that excludes it all. Let me emphasize, as Honorable Premier has already said, by wider consultation with the people of Gauteng. It is in this context that we would like to assure residents of Gauteng that we will not compromise our priorities, especially in social services such as health and education. I'm also pleased to announce that in the current financial year and through this adjustment budget, there will be no specific allocation that is required for the repayment of it all. We will make an announcement about a charge to the provincial revenue account to our resources in the budget speech in the next financial year. For this year, we are finalizing the MOU. Honorable members, having explained our approach to ETOLs, let me now proceed to outline our broader provincial revenue raising strategy, which will also cover the hybrid model of funding ETOLs and GFIP in line with the MOU that will be signed. Madam Speaker, as part of our overarching provincial strategy of raising revenue, we are alive to the fact that we do so in a difficult economic environment. In this regard, we also believe that Houghton provincial government departments must explore innovative, creative methods of raising revenue, including leveraging on the private sector investments. The Houghton provincial government currently estimates to collect 7.2 billion from existing revenue sources as part of our efforts to resource provincial priorities within a challenging environment of slow and uneven recovery from the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Part of the efforts towards increasing our revenue collection will focus on, e on efficiencies through elimination of loopholes 
in the collection mechanisms as well as exploring new revenue sources for the Houghton Provincial Government. Honorable members, let me emphasize, in collecting our revenue, there are many leakages in the packet, and we need to tighten up those. For example, the Road Traffic Management Corporation is sitting with about one billion uh, that it has, we have established through an investigation we have done, that that money was a, uh, we didn't receive it because of inefficiencies in the collection, fraud and corruption, and we will be resolving that issue with the Road Traffic Management Corporation. These are some of the things that we need to make sure we deal with. Every cent meant to be received by government must be received by the public purse. In our revenue strategy, we include, amongst others, looking at new casino regulations, automation of casino license operations, new bookmakers and bingo licenses, online renewal of motor vehicle licenses, vehicle impound facilities, and leasing of vacant land parcels. Other quick wins relate to recovery from fraudulent transactions of the motor vehicle license revenue, as I've already said. Now, honorable members, Having reached this point, let me now move to the important work of responding to the mandate of establishing the state-owned bank and the state-owned pharmaceutical company in line with the directive given by our Premier. It is anticipated that the state bank will, amongst others, do the following integrate small, micro, and medium-sized businesses, that is SMMEs, and unserviced, unserved individuals in the formal financial sector. With a unique value proposition, it will drive a mission of financial inclusion and security while offering a differentiated value proposition to customers whose needs are not being met by current bank offerings. I'd like to, to emphasize this point. Cheers, honorable members. Cheers. Cheers. Now, I did say that uh, I'll come back to this issue of the bank. It's you before noon. Welcome into the second hour of you before noon with myself, Opilo Modiha, and uh, we are uh, here um, listening to the midterm um, a provincial uh, budget speech, you know, by MEC Jacob Mamabolo, and uh, he just mentioned that you know the the Houting provincial government departments will be receiving a total of 1.5 billion rand. Um, the economic development um, will be receiving 60 million rand, and health will be receiving 1 billion. Rand education um, will be receiving 85 million rand to supplement the infrastructure funding um, that will be realistically um, spent in the by the end of uh, the financial year. And of course, the uh, human settlement is also going to be getting a hundred million rand, um, which uh, has been allocated towards the completion of incomplete infrastructure projects. So more on expenditures and allocations right here on a you before noon. My name is Bilo Mudiha. A very good morning to you. We're always in tune with you, check out our live stream on UFM898, um, on Facebook, Instagram, as well as on Twitter. Bank, honorable members, we will lead the way in investing in the townships, in informal settlements, and everywhere our people are, and make sure that we even lead the private sector to go into the bank, into the townships, and of course the areas of our people. So this bank is a tool of development, is a tool of intervention in the townships in line with our policies and of course the TIDA Act. So I just thought, let me emphasize that, that we are planting the seed to change the townships and the bank will lead that way. Now, with respect to the, um, the, 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 the company um, on the establishment of the state-owned pharmaceutical company, this company will be a medicines procurement hub and ensure that medical supplies are always available in our healthcare facilities to save lives. 
This state-owned pharmaceutical company will operate in the healthcare distribution industry. And we want it to have a strong, effective supply chain and distribution processes to ensure that sourcing and delivery of medicines to our healthcare facilities is done securely, efficiently, and on time. As medicines procurement hub, this company must also have adequate storage capacity. That meets regulatory and industry standards. Honorable members, I want to also emphasize, we cannot have such an important facility strangled in the bureaucracy of health and unable to execute its very important mandate. We need to make sure that we deliver medicine to the people, particularly women, the elderly, people with disability must get medicines in their houses. If food can be delivered to households, so medication can be delivered to the people in this province, right in their houses, and relieve them of the pressure of transport and having to queue at different hospitals the whole day having to buy food. Through this, uh, honorable members, we will deliver medicine and pharmaceutical products to the doorstep of our people. Uh, now that we are mentioning it, the Western Cape is doing it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Honorable members, let me also say, as part of the roadmap, we have already tasked a team of Gauteng Provincial Treasury and Gauteng Infrastructure Financing Agency officials to develop sound businesses, sound business cases for these projects. We have also put together a legal team led by two senior councils focusing on each to provide us with a sound legal framework related to this work. And we'll soon announce the appointment of the advisory panels to ensure support of our work and establishing these entities. Through these uh, panels, we will be able to make sure that we have a robust consultation with the people. Now, moving towards the end, honorable members, the issue of building the capable and developmental state requires us to continue implementing measures aimed at fighting fraud and corruption amongst public servants, business partners, and civil society. This requires a robust governance structure to give strategic direction on acceptable ethical behaviors in Houghton City region. Having said that, we will also ensure consequence management particularly where the Auditor General continues to raise, repeat, and ad adverse findings, and corrective or remedial action are not implemented. The days of operating with impunity are over. And we mean it when we say that. The Houghton Provincial Treasury is the custodian of the Public Finance Management Act, and we will enforce it to protect the public purse and people's resources. We will also run awareness campaigns on PFMA, which will include accounting officers to ensure that there is compliance with the rules and regulations, and that we deal decisively and swiftly with any transgressions. The law must prevail in this province, and Honorable Lusufi has, and our Premier has, put emphasis to that. Turning to local government finances, let me state that one of the most fundamental principles of sound municipal finances and managing a municipal service delivery discourse is within the ambit of tabling a funded municipal budget. In Gauteng, several of our municipalities especially those that are being led by uh, this side of the table, have not been able to achieve this. And as a remedial measure, we have allowed these institutions to table what we call uh, unfunded budget strategies that will outline how these municipalities will rehabilitate these finances over the municipal medium term revenue and expenditure framework. Starting with the upcoming table of municipal adjustment budgets and working towards the tablings of the 2023-2024 municipal budgets, Houghton Provincial Treasury, working with National Treasury and municipalities in the province will revise and redesign a framework on implementing funded budgets. Honorable members, in conclusion, in these difficult times, we are called upon to be courageous in our conviction, 
to ensure that the living conditions of the people in our province are improved. As we struggle to make the right choices, choices that must help our province and our people to succeed in life, let us draw inspiration from one of the world's greatest leaders, the late President Nelson Rolita Tamandela, who said, we must always be optimistic. We must always be optimistic. Part of being optimistic, uh, open quote, part of being optimistic is keeping one's head pointed toward the sun. One's feet moving forward. There were many dark moments when my faith in humanity was so tested, but I will not and could not give myself up to despair, close quote. As a sub-national government, the Houghton Provincial Government will not give up in forging ahead with our principled mission to improve the living conditions of our people. No matter what the difficulties, we will always keep our heads pointed towards the sun and our feet forever moving forward, knowing very well that Aluta Continua victory is certain. Honorable members, let me express my thanks to you, Honorable Premier Banyaza Lisufu, who continues to inspire us with his vision of building a developmental state that is capacitated to drive economic development and provide basic services to improve the quality of life in townships, in formal settlements, and hostels. Tish, we need to teach you, Tish, Honorable Nell. My colleagues, let me thank my colleagues in the Executive Council for friendship, for support, for teamwork, and being robust in our discussions with a focus on serving the public better. The honorable members of this house, in particular, the Finance Portfolio Committee under the leadership of Honorable Pax Tau, and of course, Honorable Sox, uh, for a diligent, uh, Honorable Kanyile for diligent oversight of our provincial finances. My thanks goes to Team Treasury, led by the HHOD, Ngumisa uh, Mnyani, and of course, uh, CEO of GIFA, uh, Mr. Opasiabi, who worked tirelessly and always with wisdom in managing our finances and supporting departments, entities, and municipalities. To citizens of Gauteng, who give us a mandate to govern and continue to hold us accountable as we implement the plans to use public finances wisely to grow our economy, create jobs, and fight poverty. Thank you very much. Thank you, honorable members. Let me hand over. Forgiveness, I pray and I know that you bless me again. Yeah, bless me again. I need you. Give me joy, give me joy. Give me joy, give me joy. Bless me again. I need you. Give me joy, give me joy.